thank you for, 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 for joining uh, me in this, in this, this afternoon. Uh, we shall speak briefly, rather, that the announcement was the Philistine as a social phenomenon in the 12th century Mediterranean. And then I understood that I have only one hour to speak, uh, now 15 minutes, so I decided that I'm going to speak about the Southern Levant. And then maybe we'll have questions and we'll try to frame it in a, in a, in a broader Mediterranean context. I'm sorry that we'll have to speak about archaeological theory, but it's going to be short and painless. <coughs> Creolization, hybridity, entanglement are key and buzzwords that have been proposed in the last couple of years, um, more or less successfully depends in the context for the study of interregional interactions, including migration. I cannot um, do better than basically quote uh, Michael Dietler, which rejects wholeheartedly these, 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 the use of these key words that basically were used as tools in other disciplines then brought to archaeology and did not help so much to promote or to further discussion about processes of migrations. So if archaeologists naively assume that every colonial situation can be reduced to a process of hybridity, then the term loses its explanatory content and ceases to explain anything. Basically, this is the dilemma of the box. If the box is big enough, then you can put everything in the universe into it. If the box is small enough, you can really have to take the social phenomena and take a big hammer and push it into the box. Uh, so hybridity, creolization, entanglement are really good, but they are rather <coughs> large boxes that are not very helpful, I think. We can, we can speak about it further later. I was proposing, just as a manner to, uh, as a matter to escape some of this impasse, to look at interactions or to look at migration, trades, raids, invasion, as not belonging to distinct social phenomena, but as belonging to a single sphere, okay, three-dimensional, even four-dimensional four of interregional interaction. So, for example, you can have in migration, you can have the Mayflower, you can have Jamestown, in trade, you can have the Ulubrun ship and you can have the Vix crater, but somewhere in between them, you have the Karum Kanish phenomenon, the old Assyrian colonies. Okay? And between raids and conquests and migration, you can have the foundation of Roman Corinth immediately after this destruction by the Romans. So these are actually phenomena that are interrelated. And you cannot deal with migration without dealing with trade. You cannot deal with trade without dealing with migration, etc. Um, this is, and I'll put it in, uh, explicitly, this is my theoretical premises for this, this coming lecture. Welcome. <clears throat> now, imagine that you're in the best um, <coughs> bakery that you've seen and in this bakery you have all the types of cakes in the world okay and you need to describe them so one way to describe them will be according to categories black forest apfelstrudel chocolate cake okay the best typology will have the same number of categories as the number of types of cakes of course it will be meaningless Okay, because it's going to be like a map of one on one to one of the world. On the other hand, if you begin to have categories like cakes that have apples inside, then you'll have problems in pushing the right cakes into the right pigeonholes. Um, so that's a problem with categorization, and this is also the big problem in uh, dealing with with the intercultural interaction. There have been many attempts to deal with this problem, including typology of my non-colonization by Brannigan and others. In my book, and I'll speak about it for two seconds for those who, who, who did not uh, uh, read it, um, and uh, to save boredom for, from you also, that instead of dealing with categories, I'm dealing with variables. Instead of dealing with the types of cakes, I'm dealing with the recipe of how to make a cake, because 
many cakes have sugar in them, many cakes have flour in them, many cakes have some form of other uh, oil or butter inside them. So if you take the parameters, in this case the ingredients, in this case the menu, how to make the recipe, how to make a, a cake, then you can actually characterize an interregional interaction. And some of them I present here, the number of people involved in the interaction. This is also for trade. This is also for invasion. This is for all form of interregional interaction. The duration of the interaction, which is critical for, the, for knowing if it, this is trade or migration. The cultural distance between the cultures, the segment of population involved, men, women, families, elite groups, professions, and the balance of power between the cultures involved in the interaction, which will have a very strong influence on the outcome of this interaction. And six, I, I think I, I put it because, because I, I felt like PC this morning, the level of pluralism and tolerance within the interacting society. Of course, this thing was not in the, on, on the top interest of people in the 13th and 12th century BC. Of course, this is but a sample of how this thing should look, and I'm working on better variables, but I think this may show you another way of how to deal with describing uh, cultural interactions. One criterion that I use is a criterion of deep change in the archaeological identification of migration, that is, deep change is when material culture assemblage is changing fast throughout different, uh, the different types of material culture and the one that is more or less uh, permanent. <coughs> what I would like to speak with you for the rest of this, of this talk is can we still speak about the old paradigms? And now I'm speaking about old paradigms of interactions at the end of the Late Bronze Age is the paradigms of contest, conquest and settlement in the Pentapolis, the five cities of the Philistines at the southern coastal plain, that is Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekon. Do we have maritime migration? Is this a commercial phenomenon? Because, of course, the antithesis to the paradigm of conquest and settlement is the commercial phenomenon advocated by, by, by Susan Sherratt. And, most importantly, what is the nature of interaction with local population? Do we have a situation, as Peter van Dommelen um, defined, of asymmetrical power relations that are typical of the colonial situation? Let's begin by going from one side to the other and see how the transition between the Late Bronze Age and the Early Iron Age occurred. And in Ashkelon, phase 21, we have an Egyptian fortress, which is abandoned, there are shifting sands on top of it, before the arrival, so-called the arrival of the Philistines. The date of this fortress is sometimes between Merneptah and Ramses III, that is, latest 13th century, earliest, uh, 12th century, <coughs> but we are sure, and we know it. We know it because of the type of pottery, but because of the type of of um, of, uh, of uh, Egyptian beer jugs. However, just on top of this abandoned um, um, Egyptian-style complex, without a destruction level, you have phases 20, 20 and 19, which are humble dwellings, no fortification, and the first appearance of locally made Aegean-style vessels. And we'll go over it later. But the most important bit is that we do not have here a destruction separates between the Late Bronze Age and the Early Iron Age. When we speak about Ashdod, the site is unfortified at the Late Bronze Age, and then at the very beginning of the Iron Age, it seems that the Canaanite Egyptianized governor residence is going through some changes without a major destruction. They're just reusing the place, but they're using it in a different manner. 
they're building this Aegean style hearths and Aegean style pottery begins to appear without any destruction. Although you'll find in literature evidence of destruction or rather claims for destruction, this destruction level was actually never found and never portrayed. But the paradigm of violent conquest was so strong that it's actually appeared in the, uh, in the literature. In Tel Miknekon, inland, basically there is a destruction of this tiny Canaanite village in the northeastern necropolis of Stratum 9, field uh, 1. However, on top of it, there's another Canaanite village. So between two Canaanite villages, there is a destruction. And then on top of them, in Stratum 7, begins the first appearance of Aegean material culture all around the tail. Much, much larger site, something like um, to, uh, 20 hectares. Finally, Tel Asafi got there are late Bronze Age levels, there are 11th century levels, but to date there's no fully excavated 12th century level. So we do not know, because on the top of the tail there is a crusader fort, we do not know yet, or rather um, Aaron Mir, the excavator, does not know yet what is the nature of transition between the late Bronze Age and the early Iron Age. To sum up. it is possible to raise significant challenges to the paradigm of violent conquest by the sea people and immediate settlement on the still smoking remains of, of the Canaanite settlement. Rather, if you look closely at the material culture remains, perhaps a new narrative should, be, should, should emerge. And now the question of how deep is the change? And here we should present numbers because the change in material culture is not only uh, of change in the quality of material culture, but also in quantity. Unfortunately, there's no available statistic to all excavations because some excavations were carried out in the 60s and thus they did not count all the pottery or even not all the rims of, of the, the vessels. We have from Ashdod area H, stratum 13, the first one of the 12th century. 73% is Canaanite, 18% is Mycenaean, 3C and Aegean, and 6% is Philistine Bichrome. Basically, it's something like 24% um, Aegean style. Of course, there's much residual material. These are long-standing tales. So there's going to be a lot of residual pottery from late Bronze Age remains. It is still going around in, 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 in the... Uh, uh, in the levels of the early Iron Age. Tell me Knekon, Field 4, Stratum 7, the earliest one, 52% Mycenaean 3C1B and coarse work cooking jugs and 48 Canaanite tradition pottery. Of course, we can, of course, have a huge fight on what is every type. Is it a gene or not? But it <coughs> just gives you amount of the scale. Um, a project I'm currently uh, involved with is the publication of Phase 20, in Ashkelon, uh, grid 38, something like 14 to 16% Aegean style in floor deposits and 24 to 26 Aegean style in open areas, probably meaning that these people really swept their floors nicely and pushing all the nice pottery, uh, the broken ice pottery to the outside. But this gives you some idea that the appearance of Aegean pottery or Aegean locally style, locally made pottery was not incidental but rather came as a major part of uh, the, uh, the pottery assemblage. Um, let's now talk about variety. I would not dwell on which form, which furumak form and which furumak uh, um, uh, shape uh, is this and um, how is it called, etc. But, but you can see that there's a variety of open forms both the skiffoy and the shallow, the, uh, the angular, uh, shallow angular balls of several different types, some strange basins, very, very uh, few kylikas, which is, which is, I think it has a meaning that there's that's so few kylikas, and a wide array 
of, of, uh, of creators, good number of them are, are pictorial from, the, from uh, Echo and an Ashdod. Uh, hopefully, in the next couple of years, you see also the assemblage from, from Ashkelon, which has also similar forms. Uh, closed forms, you have an abundance of jugs that are not canonite. Of course, the steer of jars, feeding bottles, strainer, uh, uh, strainer jugs, etc. There are also rarer forms like large hydrias uh, that are rarer. This is just to show you that there's almost a complete assemblage of Aegean pottery, not only the open serving vessels, but also um, closed serving vessels. Uh, and important missing pieces are large um, uh, stirrup jars, large commercial stirrup jars that are, that are missing. This may have also some form of significance. When we're talking about deep change, we're talking about change in behavioral patterns. Change in behavioral patterns begins at the very basic activities in every house. Cooking in each of the houses in Philistia is conducted by Aegean-style cooking jugs. And these are made from local clays, but using different clay recipes than the local canonite jugs. They, they contain much more sand, meaning that those who made them knew what they wanted to achieve in the fabric, possibly ones that are fit for slow cooking. And they come together with Aegean-style hoofs. I'm calling them Aegean-style. Of course, they can be also Western Anatolian or Cypriot, which I don't believe, but they, they may also be. And there are, there are arrays of these hoofs, mostly rectangular, sometimes keyhole, uh, sometimes round. And it's amazing that before that, none of the Canaanites had thought for the entire Middle and Late Bronze Age to put some kind of have inside their houses. I mean, they were living in winters too, but no, they, they did not do it. Also, the form of cooking, by the way, that was found just outside the modified <coughs> governor residence at Ashdod, and this guy was found by it. And look at the burn marks on the sides. All of them have burn marks on their sides. Uh, this is for, for those of you who are, who are pottery typology buffs and, and they would like to see that it has good parallels in, in, in both Greek mainland and in Crete and in numerous other places. This is a good Aegean form that is stemming from forms of the late Helladic 3b and continuing into late Helladic 3c. I'll be delighted to answer more questions about variability within this form. But back to use patterns, you can see that Ashdod, Thebes, Chania, Halasmenos, Mycenae, and numerous other sites. Basically, how they use it is they put it with the side, the fire. They put it on the edge of the hearth, and these, these things, these, these are used for slow cooking or for stewing of some form of, 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 of food that has much liquid inside it. And this takes a, this is a totally different <laughs> manner of cooking than the Canaanites are using, the Canaanites are using large open cooking uh, pots. And another interesting thing, all of them have base. They were meant to be put on a straight surface. None of the Canaanite, and also by the way, the Cypriot cooking pots of the late, the late Cypriot 2C have a base. It means they were intended to be put on straight surfaces for cooking. At the same time, there is a continuation of Canaanite cooking tradition in each and every Philistine site and in each and every Philistine house. And you can see a direct continuity in the forms of the open Canaanite cooking pot in Ashdod, but the same thing happens in Tel Miknekon and in Ashkelon. The typology continues and it, it is very similar to other Canaanite sites that are outside the sphere of the, of the Philistines. Meaning, basically, that side by side with these newly arrived cooking traditions, the old cooking traditions still were maintained. But they were maintained at the same houses. How do we know it? Because the bread ovens, the taboons, that typical 
of every Canaanite house starting from the Middle Bronze Age on do continue to appear in the earliest Philistine levels at both Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Tel Mikne Kron. In every single house, they are not connected with these, uh, with these cooking pots, but they are connected with Canaanite um, bread baking practices. And at the same time, there's a continuity in the production of local, and please excuse me for using the, the term Canaanite pottery, the, that, is, that is using both ethnic and, and, and type of pottery, but I use it the same manner as people are using Mycenaean pottery. Um, but basically there's a continuation of the assemblage of the uh, Canaanite pottery from the 13th century into the 12th century without any interruption. <coughs> Thus, for example, those who are interested in reading further about it, read, please read the article by, by Steger, Master, and myself about the pottery of, of Ashdod, the local pottery of, uh, sorry, Ashkelon, that basically showed that it's identical to the pottery of Lachish, that is further inland, but has no Aegean elements in, in it. And you have all types of pottery for all functions, starting from serving vessels, to stands, to lamps, to um, goblets, and of course the Canaanite amphoras of various types. And I'm coming to the uncomfortable feeling that every house basically had, to a large degree, two complete ceramic assemblages. I know what you're thinking. We'll get to it in the next slide. But every house, and we'll need to explain it, every house had two distinct pottery assemblages. You can cook, you can eat, you can consume your food and drink in two different traditions at the same house. And this phenomenon exists in every house excavated in Philistia. Okay, I lied, it's in two slides. <laughs> There's also a new form of textile production. While in the Late Bronze Age, there was the vertical loom probably existing in Canaan, which did not use uh, loom weights. Okay, it was a frame, and the frame had uh, a beam, and the beam was weighted by this, uh, this bagel-like stone object that you find them from time to time. Immediately at the very beginning of the Iron Age, you find these ugly, ugly things, and you don't find them one or two, you find dozens of them. And they exist in two distinct, I think two, it may be more, two distinct weight categories. Um, I'm calling them Aegean question mark because I'm not sure if they come from the Aegean or they come from Anatolia. So far, I think the earliest appearance of them if they are, is from uh, Troy during the earlier 13th century. They also exist in Chania in late Minoan 3b, uh, but not before. OK, we'll talk about it. You know what? If, if, you, if you tell me that these are Cretans, in the second edition of the book, I, I, say, I, I solve the problem and, and thank you. Because this is a big problem, because this is a new way in which you deal with uh, domestic textile production, because these appear almost in every house. And they appear by the dozens, and they also they have this distinct disposal patterns. What you do is you dig a small pit in the main room, and you discard them, and then you cover it. Many times it's connected with the hearth. Uh, by the way, there's also similar phenomena at Mount Paleo Castro. So you dig, you dig a small hole, you deposit them, it, it, it's probably connected with, with things that are happening within the house and have to be discarded within the house. But also, who would think about making these things out of mud and, and using it for, for, for textile? It's something which is really, really simple technology, but it's really, really catching. Indeed, in Philistia, it catches. And until the, ten, the, the, the 10th century, it's been used until they find something better. Um, where did it come from? It's a, it's a different question, but it appears, and it's 
very likely connected to other forms of migration. Also, the mechanism of transmission of these household uh, um, um, uh, activities is something which is extremely important because somebody had to teach all the women, children, and men in Philistia how to cook and how to uh, weave in this foreign style. So I would say it answers the criterion of a deep change. By the way, these are interesting because they come from a rural site called Kubur el Walaida, it's south of Ashkelon. So at some point it's also going outside the Pentapolis sites into the rural sites. A commercial phenomenon, as Sherrod used to say, the Philistines were actually, there was nothing like it. The Philistines they were just people that were imitating late Helladic 3C, uh, provincial ware that were made in Cyprus and other places. When trade stopped, these people started to imitate trade, therefore you have this phenomenon. However, in a, in a, in a study that uh, Anna Lucia Dagata, Hans Momsen, and, and, and me have conducted uh, a decade ago, We've actually located all the imported 3C from, uh, from Canaan, and they, all of them come from sites north of the valley of Jezreel. None of them come from Philistia. So it seems that, and, and we sample dozens of them, and they all come from Cyprus, besides like one or two. So it seems that trade was never a factor in igniting the local production of late Aladic 3C ware. Which is amazing. It's also amazing why we couldn't find any Cypriot, and it's really easy to find Cypriot late Aladic 3C style pottery because it's, it's, it's whitish material or creamish material. It's beautiful, it's really easy to find. And of the tens of thousands of, of sherds that were analyzed from, from Ashkelon and even more from the other sites of Philistia, they're simply not found. There are very, very few other imports. There's one storage yard, which is possibly Cilician, coming from Ashkelon. But it is so rare that it's even not worth uh, speaking about as something that may ignite local production. <coughs> now, something about the Philistine as a hydrophobic phenomenon. How interesting is that, that when people that are, have a gene material culture traits are settling in Cyprus, they choose to do it by the sea. When they settled in Chios, in Emborio, they do it in a fantastic promontory by the sea. When they do it in Crete, they're probably doing it by the sea. Okay, because it's, it's a nice place, look at the... Uh, look at Palo Castro Castri. I mean, all these sites are, you know, a, a variation on the theme of, of Palo Castro Castri. When these people get to southern Canaan, immediately what they do first is get away from the sea. So all the sites, apart from Ashkelon, are non-coastal. And they're fantastic places to start. Look at this place. I mean, if I was... Uh, if I was some, some Cretan person of the 12th century and I was looking at this beach, you have to erase some of the sands here. I mean, this is like, this is like it, it's looking like something like Cucunarias on Paros or, or something, something like this. A promontory with two places that you can, you can, uh, harp, you can use it as, as, a, as a dual harbor. Fantastic place. No, they were not using it, okay? And this is Yavni, I'm half the way between Ashdod and, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and Jaffa. And there's also other sites. The site of Ashdod is inland. The harbor site of Ashdod, on the estuary of the Lachish River, was inhabited until the 13th century. But, and, it's, and it's a fantastic place. No, of course, nobody will settle there in the, in the 12th century. It's too risky. It's on the, you can see the sea from there. So that's a, it's a big, big problem, and I don't know what to do with it. The Philistines in the south are not maritime phenomenon, okay? If they come by boats, the first thing they do is to make a huge bonfire by the coast, then run to the hills, okay?
So this is a path in Mediterranean uh, uh, um, history that is not taken by these people. The connectivity as, a, as adaptive strategy of risk management. No, they feel insecure enough. They don't want to be by the sea. Only in the 11th century, or rather towards the late 11th century, they begin to reconnect to the sea with the renewal of trade with Cyprus. These are just you know, the iconic images of, of, of connectivity. All right, okay, that's what I promised you. So you have two assemblages in, in, which, in each house. Do we have hybrid forms? Because that is what, if the theory about hybridity is correct, or creolization, we should expect immediate mixture of sorts when it's not happening. Decoration of the first phase of the Iron Age is very Aegean. Immediately later, it's becoming even more Aegean. I mean, I mean the, the percentage of Aegean pottery is rising after the first, first stage of, this, of, 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 uh, of Philistine settlement. And when you have hybrid forms, they're very, very rare. This, for example, is coming from 11th century uh, Tel Mikonekron, and it shows an Aegean style crater with the, the Canaanite palm tree, another one of these here, uh, also of uh, 11th century, and this is late 11th century from Tel Kassila, also of that palm tree. So I would not say that there are forms of hybridity within the core of Philistia, but when you're going to the periphery, when you don't have good mechanisms for cultural transmission, you begin to have not hybridization, but innovative forms. Because the processes of cultural transmission do not work so well in the periphery. So for example, in places like Megiddo, in places like Tel Kassila, in North of Philistia, what you have is hybrid forms, oh, whoops, it should be called innovative forms, that combine the lower part of the Canaanite cooking pot with the upper part of the Aegean style cooking pot, and you get this. And this, ladies and gentlemen, will be the canonical cooking pot of the Iron Age to throughout, throughout Israel, okay? And it, it, it was formed by this form of imperfect uh, cultural transition, transmission. Do you wanna see another example in the most basic uh, forms of, of material culture? These guys, okay? These guys continue all the way to the late 11th century in all the Philistine sites. One of them exists in Megiddo, but in the periphery, what you have them is they becoming more squat, and then some genius Canaanite said, oh, let's make a hole inside them. It will be so much easier. So therefore, you have these hybrid forms in late 11th century, Tel Kassila, ah, this, this was the, the, the most successful kid in the kindergarten, eh? And, and <laughs> you can see that these are innovative, innovative forms. This is also 11th century at uh, Megiddo. And then they decide why not to make them larger, and then you have the donut shape loom weight, which will be the, the typical Iron Age too. But these innovations are happening only in the periphery. They don't happen in the core, because in the core, the processes of cultural transmission within the domestic sphere are strong. Uh, just to, to quote a, a very good article of, of, of Jung, which shows this how, how uh, hybrid forms are formed in the Syrian coast in Tel Kazel. He showed how you take a Mycenaean form and how you take local elements and you create this, this hybrid form. Uh, this may exist much more in the Syrian coast than it's happening in uh, in, 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 uh, in the southern Canaanite coast of in Philistia. Now I, have, now I have to tell you a narrative because every reconstruction must have a narrative. And the narrative will also have to answer how 
transmission, how cultural transmission happened. Of course, you can change it with different narrative, but I would argue that it is essential to have a narrative rather than to have a vague term. Because if you have a vague term, you have still this box in which you can put the entire universe. If you have a narrative, you have to either improve your narrative, reject it, or suggest a new narrative. Therefore, I put my head below, uh, on, on the block and suggest a narrative. And the narrative is saying that already in the process of settlement, you have intercultural families. And in an article that 15 years ago, Deborah Sweeney and I were, were writing about the women in the Medina Tabu reliefs, we have noticed that all of them have different hairdos. Actually, some of the women are Syro Canaanite or Hittite men, but it does not matter. <laughs> but the interesting bit is, and it, it's very likely that those who, that because it's a unique scene in Aegean, Egyptian art, there is no other one that they can copy. There is no Ramses II relief that is showing Ramses II fighting these feathered head people. So it's, it has to be some form of truth inside or some form of depiction inside. So if you see that these women have all different hairdos, I would argue that they reflect intercultural um, unions that are occurring throughout the routes of their migration by the time that they're, they're reaching uh, to Philistia. And when they go to find found new settlements, such as in Ashkelon, on the ruined remains of the Egyptian, or Aegean fort, Egyptian fort, they don't do it alone. They do it with the local Canaanites that also need a place to, to, to do it and with beneficial uh, results for, for, for everybody. So I would not also argue that these people came in force trying to destroy everything in their wake. I don't think it would fly well with the local Canaanite population. But rather what happened was the formation of a multicultural society that existed more or less for 200 years, or at least multicultural behavioral patterns existing within every household in Philistia. Children are manifesting group identity. You can see it on the 25th of March in Greece, and you can see it in these young Philistines Philistine boys that already have the, the, the headdress of the adults. This is a really important trait because it's showing how this identity is moving from one generation to the other. I cannot stress enough the importance of socialization within the domestic sphere. I would not uh, uh, begin to quote here from Baudier about the formation of the habitus. But these rather evocative images of uh, women and their, their, their children very busy in doing the most important thing, which is to observe other people doing things and to imitate by seeing, is, I think, what was happening in each one of these houses in Philistia. May I speak now about one or many events? We assume the sea people as a horde of people uh, probably riding a big arrow that is coming from one place in the Mediterranean to another place where the arrow ends. I would rather like to raise a possibility of several events that are happening more or less at the same time, that you have scouts, initial settlers, a group of men, families, and only later, there's a beginning of production of material culture. So basically, you will not see the very, very first group of settlement, or settlers, or the, the, the phases of settlement. And if you have several groups of these coming for different sites or coming to the same site, how would you know who is there? And what I would like to argue very briefly, if you're looking very, very carefully, you can see minute differentiation between the different sites in Philistia in aspects of material culture that may indicate more than one group. 
variability in the late Teladic 3C style pottery exists between the sites. For example, in Ashdod and Tel Miknekron, there's this typical bird. In Ashkelon, the typical birds appear only later. In Ashkelon, there's also a style that is um, um, geometric, which is very different than the earlier style of, of Ashdod and Tel Miknekron. This may indicate that at least those who produced the pottery did not come from one tradition at the same time. Something extremely interesting I was speaking with, uh, with Reinhard Jung very recently is the great variability in the, in the typology of the Aegean style cooking pot rims. This we have not published yet, but it's interesting. He said that in Encomi, for example, you have one type of rim. That's it. In Philistia, you have several. You have straight rim, gutter rim, a rim with, this, with, this, with small, a slight inclination, etc. This may indicate, not to mention also variability in the form, forms of the base, this may indicate that starting from the earliest phases, there is variability, and the variability should be meaningful. And we're talking about really the, the earliest, earliest, perhaps <coughs> the earliest 10 years of, of, of settlement. Other differences may be regional or temporal. For example, where do you have rounded halves and where do you have rectangular? I tend to think that the rounded are later and the rectangular are earlier. All the rectangular are 12th century and early 11th, and then you begin to have, in places like Tel Mikne, Korn, and in Gath, you begin to have these rounded pebble ones in the 11th century. Why is it coming in the 11th century? I may give you some ideas soon. Uh, the idea I wish to sell you about the, 12th, uh, the 11th century is that something happens with Cyprus. And it's possible that the renewal of contacts with Cyprus is slightly earlier than thought. And thus, Cypriot types of the proto-white painted are getting into the Philistine bichrom repertoire already, let's say, in the early 11th century, this bottle, this horn-shaped bottle, and I think also the hearth belongs to the same, uh, the same tradition. Uh, another perhaps manifestation of this in this area of cult, the incised uh, scapula of cows that is appearing also in the 11th century. Is this connected with migration or not? That's a really big question. Because not all the traits change on one hand. On the, other one, on the other hand, it's possible that if there was small migration, the migrants could do very well with the existing Aegean-style material culture uh, and only introduce few of the new style. So I would separate between the events of the early 12th century and the events of the earliest 11th century. I think they belong to different phenomena, and they should be differentiated with all vigor. And I'm sure these things happen also in other places besides, uh, besides the, uh, the southern coast of Israel, so, so we should be aware of this. Ah, and there's this thing. During the 12th century, there's no handmade burnished ware in all Philistia. There are arguments there's one vessel in, 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 in Tel Mikne Kron that is somewhat warped at the bottom, so it's connected with handmade burnished ware. No. Also in the 11th century, let's face it, there's not too much handmade burnished ware. I mean, there's these things in the shrine of Tel Kassile uh, that, that we have published, and they are handmade and they are burnished. If they are handmade and burnished, are they handmade burnished? Well, that's a big question. One of them, however, is not local. It's imported. But at any case, these things happen in the 11th century. And finally, in the 11th century, you have introduction of iron. And it's certain that these things come from Cyprus because, you know, these guys are from Ancomi. These guy, this, this, this guy come from 11th century Tel Mikne. There's others from Tel Kassila. Of course, the origin was uh, something uh, that we made, was made of bronze and, and probably from the Dodecanese, like the knives from, the, from Yalisos. Also, this sword pommel from gold, there's also one like it. It looks somewhat Italian to me, and we have to, I, I'm, I'm working on it now, but 
that's besides the point. So we have to make a very clear distinction between the 12th century and the 11th century interactions. To conclude, we need a theory for interaction. We need a theory that will include a descriptive vocabulary. We need to commit rather than to use catch-all phrases. I would suggest you can take it or leave it, use interaction par parameters as a criteria and deep change as a criteria for migration. I would support the existence of multicultural society in Philistia. I would encourage to follow and check if this idea exists in the sites in the coast of Syria and in Cyprus. I would argue that there's no evidence for colonial asymmetry between migrants and local population. There's no evidence for conquest. There's no evidence for say, discrimination of local Canaanite population. Rather, it seems that Canaanite pottery and Aegean-style pottery are, con are, are made at the same kilns, by the same potters, consumed at the same houses, but from different recipes. And there's differentiation between sites. This may indicate different events of settlement or different origins of settlers. We have a big lacuna of our understanding of Western Anatolia and Southwestern Anatolia during the um, latest Bronze Age. <coughs> I think that if we look at the origin for all this phenomenon, the origin cannot be in Cyprus because Cyprus was also people came from Cyprus. It's not similar enough, the, the pictorial pottery is not similar enough to Crete. It has some similarity to the Carnisos. So I would look for the origin of some of these people somewhere south of, of, of the Dodocanisos, but this is, of course, a speculation. We talked about Cypriot impact only in the 11th century. Before that, you don't have Cypriot impact. How do we know it? Because there is no Cypriot course words in the earliest Aegean style or the earliest phases of <coughs> settlement in Philistia. Which is funny because before that, during the Late Bronze Age, there's plenty of uh, hand, hand of uh, will made uh, um, um, uh, Cypriot words. Something to think about. I would argue, but this of course should be proved, that there are different patterns of interaction with the Aegean world in Israel, Cyprus, Lebanon, and Syria. In each place, the interaction was different. In each case, the interaction was a result of power relations between the newcomers and older population. In many cases, it was accompanied by other types of interactions, such as raids, and in many cases, especially the Phoenician coast, we trade with Cyprus. So we should look at it really close and not lump all these areas together. And what is most intriguing for me these days is not all material culture aspects are carried within the so-called same cultural package. That is, you can get handmade burnished ware all the way to, let's say, Rasi Ben Khani and perhaps more to the south, but you don't get them in Philistia. On the other hand, you can get these loom weights all around. So it's very likely there are different mechanisms of transmission that we still have to refine our understanding of them. Thank you very much. <laughs>